Resilience maintains a Haskell package more or less actively on Hackage. Okay, that's like two or three. So basically, you're the audience. Um, this is a, a small thought on. Well, well, the thought is really we painted ourselves in a corner where we do the, all this maintenance of dependency ranges, and it, I think it's a lot of work, and it seems to be more work from what we had achieved. I don't have a solution for that problem, but I thought it would be at least be nice if you know, some dependency of yours gets updated that you have to do as little as possible. So ideally, you like, you know, you do nothing or something tells you, well, there's a new, new version, should everything be automated? And, and they did little things in that direction. Um, so let me, uh, let me show you what you can play around with if you want. So the first thing I, Should I make, no, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, sorry for not using my own laptop. Um, this means there's a slight delay, but uh, should be somewhere here, no, ah, there was. Um, first piece that I wanted to show you is not very surprising. It's a, a GitHub action you can add to your repository and once a week or whatever you configure it, it will run Cabal um, outdated, look at which packages have new versions that are not supported by your library, and will create a pull request um, to, um, to propose updating that. Now that's nice and easy, right? It's like one step that takes the pain away of upgrading. But there's an interesting problem here. Imagine this tool runs on your repository, or maybe you don't have the tool, but somebody comes along and is very nice and creates a pull request updating the upper bound on a dependency on your package. And your CI is green. What do you do? Say again? Quick merge. Quick merge. That's wrong. <laughs> do you know what's, why that's wrong? Okay, so I'll, I'll paint this in the room here. So you have your package is here. You, uh, package foo. You depend on A and also on B. Now A gets a new version. You allow the new version of A, in, or somebody else in a pull request, allows a new version of A. But maybe B also depends on A and doesn't allow the new version yet. Now CI runs, Cabal, the dependency solver, looks at all dependencies, finds out, oh, I can't use the new version, I'll use the old, ver old version. CI is green because you haven't done anything new but you click the button and you t merge it and, and then maybe later B gets the new version and, and, then, and then actually people are able to use the new version of the dependency together with your package and it, it may break. So this is the first thing to be aware of. You can't just merge a green PR, which inherently sounds like we're doing something wrong. If it's green, it should be okay. Uh, otherwise CI is kind of broken. So there, there are two little more pieces I can, yes? I didn't understand anything you just said, but it sounds, it sounds Okay, I'll, I'll do it once more. I need a more clear, maybe I don't need it, but I don't understand what goes wrong. Okay. Uh, so I, is it written down anywhere? Yes, yes, yes. Um, there's a section here. Um, okay, basically what I just said for those who want to read along is this. Let's, can I make this? Is it option plus or control plus or command plus to make it larger? <laughs> On a Mac. <laughs> command plus. Thanks. Um, so, wait, okay, your package depends on, on bar and, oh. sorry, um, with an upper bound. Uh, and now, you also some other dependency. And now a new version of bar gets released. Now, the question is, can you bump your, can you allow the new version 1.2 uh, in your package? So, so you create a pull request, you run it through, through CI, and it may turn green. But this does not mean you've actually tested against the version you allow, because the constraint solver may not pick that version for other reasons. And if you now merge this pull request updating the upper bound, then you, it, well, it, it's, it's, um, then you might have a problem. Okay, um, maybe maybe the problem comes clear when it shows the, solu the solution or. It's not because of that. It's independent of the cache. It, it's really, Cabal is trying to figure out a set of packages for which 
all involved packages are happy, and that may not include the version you are trying to test. Because you may depend on that, which depends on bar one, one, two. Yeah, that's the last line there, yeah, precisely. Is there was a question there? Okay, so the first thing I, well, it's actually the second thing, chronologically, but that doesn't really matter. So let's see. There is, um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, press the right button. Um, so one way of, of, of approaching the problem is, um, well, the problem is the upper bound to cabal means any version below is fine, but really when you're running CI, you, after you just updated this bound, you really want to run the latest version in the UCI. That's the thing you want to test. So one little tool that I created is uh, cabal force upper bound, which does what it says. Um, here's a little example. Uh, you, you run it on your cabal file, and it gives you a set of um, constraints you can pass to cabal that make sure that you really run against the upper bound. So you could integrate that into your CI system as like a, one of the cases in the matrix. And then if somebody bumps the upper bound of your dependencies and the pull request turns green, then it is safe to merge. Uh, yep, question? then the pull request will be read because Kabal will tell you I can't find a solution, which is precisely what you want to have in this case. Okay, okay. Um, so this is already kind of useful maybe to some. Um, if you want to be really pedantic, and I mean we're Haskellers, um, you might notice that it's not just the upper bound that may be a lie. Let's say you've upgraded your dependency a few times, you're always updating the upper bound, you're changing the code, you still claim in your Cabal file that you support version 0.1 from five years ago, maybe. But you've probably changed your code, you've maybe changed how you use that library. So if somebody now tries to use the latest version of your package with an old version of that thing for whatever reason, it's quite likely that it breaks. And if you don't want your Cabal bounds to be a lie in the sense that claiming to work with something that you're not actively testing, then you need to put in a little more effort. And uh, there's a another tool and action and so on you can use here. It's called Cabal Plan Bounds, which relieves you from having to touch Cabal Bounds in your Cabal file completely. The principle is, like, what I just described as a problem, the like CI is not testing what the bounds are saying, you can just turn around into a solution and say the bounds should always be what you're testing on CI. So if you use this tool, which combines the build plans from various CI jobs. So you run it against multiple versions of THC and multiple stackages, multiple these things. It take, collects all the, the build plans and calculates the bounds of what you are actually testing. So we can see this in action in one of my, um, okay, this was the wrong, how do I get to the, no. Oh well, I can just navigate by clicking, um, maybe. I, don't f I didn't, can't find the URL, but it, it's okay, I'll, 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 I'll click to it. Oh, we're on full, full screen. It's fine. Uh, it's actually better this way because then people can follow the mouse and that's more friendly for the audience. So don't, don't worry what this library is about, but if you look at, um, at, at one of these, yeah, the CI for maybe the latest commit, then it, uh, it runs a bunch of, uh, of configurations. You can see the upper bound, which is the one I showed. And then there's a last drop. And if you look at the, at the, at the matrix, you'll see it depends on all the pre previous ones. Where did I go get the, so yeah. You can see that follows all the other ones. And there it, it takes all the cabal bounds, uh, sorry, all the build plans, and calculates the cabal bounds from that. And then it, it'll, does it actually say something useful here? Probably just says no, it's, it's, it, because it's up to date. It doesn't say anything here. It would update the pull request to change the cabal bounds to what they should be according to what you have tested. This wasn't prepared, so maybe it wasn't fully clear. Um, and, and, and happy to take questions. But I thought I'd, I'd share it to, to you that like, we can have this thing here. Um, oh, sorry. Um, maybe I can show you the cabal file that comes out of this if I'm... So you get um, rather systematic 
um, bounds where these are precisely the versions that I'm testing this on CI, and therefore they're more. Oh, uh, this is a feature of Cabal since a few years of saying uh, this version or any version where the PVP implies that it's which should still the, the the package versioning policy. So that this still works. So basically, it's uh, larger than this, uh, larger or equal than this, but smaller than um, than the next major bump. There's a short syntax for a range, and and there's little. Yeah. Okay, I just thought I wanted to share this to the crowd. Um, any, any? Tested. I mean, there's sort of like uh, know, three to the four combinations. There. I don't, I don't, there's, there's a lot of potential combinations. That's true. I, You've actually tested all of those. Not all combinations, but at least. Not really big yes, correct. <laughs> I. Um, the 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 cross interaction between dependencies is something that I did not address here at this. Um, which Can even that? Uh, you could probably express it as like a big set of alternative dependencies with flags or something. Um, probably. Okay, so. The, uh, the question was whether the solver would, would have problems with so many disjunctions. Um, I. I th yeah, yeah. If if everybody was, would do that, if that would be a problem, I don't think it would be because I think even like a normal range, Cabal just treats as like trying one after another, so it it shouldn't make a big difference. Um, and yeah. Will you still be able to resolve any issues without just running around you on everything? Will humans have deal with have problems with? That? I don't. I don't know if this is really much. Um, uh, so much worse than than a range from zero point one to zero okay to to zero point ten, just listing the intermediate ones. Um, uh, oh. Okay, I guess Ben didn't. Did oh, oh, did, you, did you have a question or you were moving towards the microphone? Sorry, <laughs> I don't want to miss not your question. question. So much the comment, but because. Uh, the point of uh, Simon's point of, well, you're not being all that picky, and that is true. And, th and in this case, I think that's fair. Uh, but just for everybody else in the room, there is, there was, we had in the Haskell community at one point, uh, the Hackage Matrix Builder, uh, which actually did attempt to build sort of you know, many combinations of, of package, uh, package versions uh, and make that information, uh, which plans are feasible and which actually build, uh, available via web interface. And I think that is an area which uh, it sounds like a really nice approach that never really panned out. Uh, I think for the implementation reasons, if somebody wanted a project, I think it would be a great contribution to the community as a whole. Let's pick that up again. Yeah, cool. Indeed. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, slightly off topic, but how do you have 275 repositories? <laughs> <laughs> um, just get as old as I am, and then it, it just it <laughs> accumulates over time. It's, 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 it's like wrinkles in the skin. It just comes for after a while. And give some lightning talks to help you. Yeah. Well, also just noticed I made one statement to make, and already was three repositories involved, so you can <laughs> easily inflate it. <laughs> okay, uh, any, anything else? If not, then um, well, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me, since my laptop is up, let um, me say, uh, oh no, yeah. that. Is it, let me see, uh, HDMI? Yeah, I, but I just, let me just show, so oh, yeah. there is another, I don't know what's going on, but there is another session, ah, uh, there, there is this. There you can just go, ah. Uh, I am using the chair. Ah, this. Because both of them are there, it's going feedback. Uh, using the chair. No, the chair is mute. Okay, now. No.
the chair? Yeah, um, I just want to say that there is another session of Lightning Talks tomorrow at 12. And if you want to register, you can go here and just write your name here. We already have one. And today we're going to have a second Lightning Talk by Ben, correct? That is right, yeah. Good. Apologies, this was actually... That's yours. This no, is that's right. mine. I'm just right here. Apologies. Let me just turn this off for just a moment. No, there we are. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yeah. All right, great. So, um, yes, today I would like to uh, just talk a bit about some of the work that we've been doing in GHC to uh, improve the test coverage of our backend. Uh, this isn't necessarily going to be new to anybody, I fear, uh, but it, nevertheless, I thought it, it, you know there's some lessons that we have uh, sort of gleaned in the process of this uh, of this work, and um, I, I'm I'm rather happy with the outcome. So I thought it would be appropriate to sort of share here, given that. Um, could use some some talk. So, yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, first we're going to start off with uh, some sort of role playing here. So, if you imagine for a moment that you're a compiler engineer uh, working on a functional language compiler, and one morning, as you often do, you wake up and uh, come down, start reading your email, and you see a ticket. Uh, and uh, like many tickets, uh, or unlike many tickets, this actually uh, sort of starts to bring shivers down your spine. You're the first word, uh, you see the word incorrect, and then UTF-8 decoding, and, and this is, you know, incorrectness, actually getting the wrong answer, well, this is actually quite bad. Uh, you know, well, crashes, the user has some idea that something has gone horribly wrong. You know, they, uh, if the program actually does terminate, this is not actually working, is it? Here? Thank you. Okay. Is that? No. <laughs> Can you? There we are. Oh, that's a little bit better, I guess. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> right. So, uh, well, Crashes are something that you know users. Uh, you know, it's it's, it's unpleasant. Uh, incorrectness is essentially arbitrarily bad. You know, turning positive bank balances into negative and, and this sort of thing, which users tend not to uh, not to appreciate. So, uh, you looking through this ticket, start to wonder, oh, well, you know, this is, uh, this looks quite unpleasant, and you start to think a little bit about why this might be, and of course, uh, you know, play around in GHCI, re reproduce the issue, and start thinking a little bit, and, uh, you know, you, well, uh, you start thinking about the, where this problem could lie, and of course, thinking about the size of the program that you're trying to debug, it's, it's a little daunting, right? I mean, you, GHC itself is a, a multi-hundred thousand line uh, piece of software. But, you know, thankfully we all know that it's well engineered and, and uh, composed, as many co compilers are, uh, in sort of a pipeline, right? We can start to think about individual pieces in isolation. And they have well-defined interfaces in the form of intermediate representations. Now, uh, for a long time, GHC uh, were dealt with testing, sort of going from parsing all the way down to object code, right? And, and making sure that the extra object code that uh, arose from a particular compilation, uh, from a particular source program, uh, was sort of consistent with the uh, expected semantics by way of just compiling and then running, right? And, th and that's where most of GHC's uh, test coverage comes from. We have a test suite of many thousands of small modules that we, we run, or at least compile, and uh, we make sure that we get the expected outcome. But that approach, obviously, as we see from our ticket here, doesn't always catch everything. And in fact, as we know, testing large systems like compilers is quite difficult. So how can we do better? Well, thinking about uh, sort of the context of our, of our ticket here, 
uh, you know, we, we know uh, that recently GHC merged an ARH64 backend, and in fact, this ticket manifests on ARH64. So maybe that's the reason. And we, we can look at our, our diagram here and say, ah, well, okay, so this ARH64 backend is, in fact, this uh, well, this box right here. And so we expect that this is going to take in, uh, this box takes in C minus minus, one of the intermediate representations of GHC, one of many, and it's going to output assembler. And so maybe we can actually just focus our testing efforts on this bit here. And so now instead of having to worry about trying to generate, you know, or if, if we want to do it, take a randomized testing uh, approach to finding the ticket in question here, that we don't need to worry about generating random Haskell programs that might generate the, uh, that manifest the program, but rather we can worry about just generating C minus minus programs. Uh, and then we could potentially think of ways that we might take advantage of randomized testing and, and assert that the programs generated have the expected C minus minus semantics. Uh, so this is, in fact, um, what I did. Um, now, you might think, you know, looking through C uh, the GHC's uh, AST, the C minus uh, minus type of expressions, is actually quite straightforward. Um, so you might think, okay, well, uh, you know, how bad can this possibly be? Of course, if you look here at this middle constructor here, this is really, this, this constructor is doing quite a bit of work, right? This is the mach op type, uh, constructor, which of course carries a mach op or machine operation uh, value in it. And this is essentially an enumeration of all the prim ops that uh, GHC supports. This is when you write add int hash in your uh, Haskell program, what is going to manifest, uh, how that's going to, this, this mach op constructor is how this uh, prim op is going to manifest in the back end. And of course, there are many, many prim ops here. So the question is, how do we go about actually testing that these things are doing what we expect? Well, uh, around two years ago on a cold October morning, uh, this sort of situation, uh, this, this ticket that I uh, point to here actually uh, I was the one on the receiving end of this, and I uh, was faced with these questions and realized, you know, well, the, the current testing infrastructure that we have, given that there are so many more backends that we are either adding or um, have added in recent history, we really need to do better here. And so um, this gave rise to this test primops package, which you will find on GitLab. Uh, and of course, uh, it is an implementation of a, essentially a quick check style test suite for C minus minus programs and a simple yet fairly descriptive description of C minus minus's expe uh, expected semantics, particularly currently focusing on its expression language. Um, moreover, it provides uh, so in order, how do we actually go about testing C minus minus programs? Well, of course, we need a few things. We need a way to generate programs. We need a way to, uh, to compute the expected result of a particular program. And we need a way to run the program against GHC's actual backend and, um, and evaluate its result. Um, and that is what G uh, test promops provides. So to sort of uh, very quickly go through, uh, you know, how we start to think about C minus minus programs and their semantics, well, we can start by thinking about what is a number? Well, uh, numbers in C minus minus are actually uh, a bit tricky because C minus minus is, of course, a low level language uh, and numbers in general are just bit patterns. Uh, they aren't real, uh, it's certainly not real numbers, uh, nor are they necessarily uh, natural or integer. Uh, rather, they're bit patterns that have particular meanings to particular operations. And this is where a case where we need to be uh, quite careful. Um, well, multiplication, uh, for instance, may interpret a number as signed, uh, and addition may interpret it the same value as unsigned. And so uh, we need to be explicit about both the signedness and the width of our, of our uh, literal numbers. Um, we can then generate programs, which again, we're going to be focusing on the expression subset of the C minus minus language. And expressions, of course, are going to consist of the various prim ops that uh, there we are. Nope. There are the various prim ops, uh, which we can write explicitly as a, uh, a gadget, of course, indexed on its width, the width of the result, um, as well as uh, memory operations, relation oper relational operations, and literals. And we might think that, uh, and, and you, we can pretty easily write a generator for this uh, in, in quick check style. This, uh, that's quite straightforward. The shrinker is less so, but we'll, we'll pass over that for a moment. 
Of course, then we pretty quickly find that the compiler is more clever than we'd like, right? So you know, we can write uh, one plus one as a test program, but that's not going to get anywhere near the back end. GHC is quite clever, even in C minus minus, at uh, simplifying uh, constant expressions like that. And so we need to be, be take care to introduce uh, constructs in our expression type that will hide the inside, the structure of, of expressions from the simplifier by way of, for instance, taking um, uh, replacing the results, the value of, uh, in uh, behind a memory access, or um, by way of a, some explicit opaque primop. Uh, we can then define semantics of our uh, of our language. Um, this is actually something that was incredibly useful uh, in that C minus minus being a rather old language. Uh, and, and having diverged quite uh, a long time ago from the original paper that defined it, uh, had quite a few, and continues to actually have quite a few uh, infelicities with that paper. Um, there's uh, still sort of an active uh, effort to define uh, what we actually mean by C minus uh, minus programs, but um, currently working on this. Uh, and we can then write, uh, given our interpreter, our pure interpreter, from expression to the result of that expression, which is of course just a number, we can then uh, write uh, a more generic uh, form of interpreter, which of, of course may accommodate I.O. since we will need to run the compilers when we're going to actually evaluate this C minus minus program via compilation. Uh, and then we write the means of doing precisely that. So we can t we emit the C minus minus representation of our test program. We can then take compile that with the tested C minus minus, which may be different from the C minus. Uh, I'm sorry, the G tested GHC, which of course may be different from the GHC that we use to compile test primops, the actual test suite driver. And that's actually quite important because we need to ensure that if a bug is, uh, we, we may be testing a buggy compiler. And if we test a buggy compiler using a test suite that itself was compiled with a buggy compiler, we may not actually see the failures uh, of our buggy compiler, right? The, the infelicities of our, um, of these buggy cases. So um, we have are really two compilers relevant here. We have uh, sort of the compiler that we are using to compile the test suite and the compiler that we are using to compile the test cases and that is the compiler, that latter compiler is what we are actually testing. We can then finally uh, execute our, um, the, the object code that results. Uh, that is a bit of a tricky process, um, but this allows us, um, you know, will, we will uh, sort of leave that as an exercise for the reader, but that gives us an interpreter, uh, a compile, compilation based interpreter, which we can then compare against the interpreter that we previously had, uh, the pure interpreter, uh, the reference interpreter, if you will, uh, provided by the test suite driver. Uh, we can then write a very simple property. Uh, of agreement between these two interpreters on a particular, on the interpretation of a particular expression, and that allows us to um, to deploy quick uh, quick check and all of its wonderful tools against compiler C, uh, bugs in C minus minus. So, uh, was it worth it? Yes, uh, absolutely. We've had actually, uh, I think, over a dozen bugs uh, issues so far um, have been identified in various uh, C minus minus backends, um, the native code generator primarily, um, and uh, nearly all of these have been fixed. Uh, so. There are, of course, are quite a few tricky cases. Um, conservative approximations, in particular, uh, require special treatment. Things like uh, the Molme Oflow mock-op, which tests whether a particular multiplication of two operands overflows the word size. Um, this is something that uh, the particular uh, C minus minus uh, the code generator may actually opt to be conservative uh, in its result uh, and say that things may overflow when they in fact do not. So that of course uh, you have to be careful to uh, define the semantics of these operations correctly. Um, uh, but there's quite a few other things that you can do once you have all this infrastructure. And so, um, in particular, we found it was very useful to be able to check uh, foreign calling conventions. If you do have a foreign uh, call to a C function, for instance, from, uh, via C minus uh, minus, this is an area where, on some platforms, uh, this is quite tricky to get right. And uh, another area we, we, where we have found bugs. This is something that we've uh, we, we've implemented and has been quite useful uh, on Darwin in particular. 
Uh, checking of floating point operations is, of course, uh, rather tricky and requires particular attention when we're, um, since we need to worry about what the constant folding may do as well. Um, this is actually in progress. Uh, Sven Tenney is currently working on this, uh, who's a, a contributor. Um, we have uh, an effort on foot to uh, start checking the imperative fragment of C minus minus. This is, of course, quite tricky, but um, there have been issues which we recognize this current approach, which focuses on the pure subset of C minus minus will not catch. And finally, uh, we uh, actually handle cross compilation as well. Uh, this has been very useful when uh, testing the JavaScript and WASM backends. Um, and uh, we don't discuss this here, but um, anyways, um, that is that. If you uh, are interested in contributing to test primops, uh, the project is on GitLab. And thank you for listening. A very quick question. Arno Spivak, <coughs> Arno Spivak from Twig. Uh, it's a quick question. I'm not sure the answer is quick. Um, so uh, my intuition uh, when you started speaking about semantics was, uh, oh, we are going to run two different backends, one against the other, because we're testing bugs in primops. It's very unlikely that they have the same bugs. So you chose to instead implement uh, reference semantics in addition to what already existed. Why? Likelihood of finding bugs there, thank you, um, is actually quite high. Uh, and the reason for those bugs is almost certainly that, you know, the two authors of these backends probably did not agree on the semantics of the language itself. I thought it would be a useful, and it was, in fact, a very useful exercise to myself go and think about those semantics and try to figure out, well, uh, if, if we were to start afresh here and um, decide uh, and document a, uh, you know, the, the intended behavior of C minus minus, what would that behavior be? Um, and, well, uh, needless to say, there are many more cases than I initially uh, expected. You know, this is, this is actually uh, rather tricky. And there are, continue to be cases which we uh, have not defined or are trying to decide on. Um, but having a clean Haskell implementation of those semantics has been very useful in reasoning. Um, and we have now uh, typically, you know, you, you, we hope that this is going to be sort of the reference implementation against which backends can be written uh, going forward. So that's, I think, maybe the... Uh, that answers the question, yes. Great. Thank you very much. Hi. Alexa Radol, Google. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so you found bugs. Um, how does the process of locating where the bugs are in the back end and fixing them compare to fixing user-submitted bugs? Ah, uh, well... Um, the problem with user-submitted bugs is there aren't that many of them. Uh, but we know that there are bugs in the compiler. Uh, so, you know, th th there's first the difference of we actually can easily identify and, you know, with, with relative... It doesn't take a lot of computation to actually find a good number of bugs with this model, despite the fact that, you know, programs are you're generating trees and, of course, that, uh, you know, scales pretty poorly. Uh, there are a fair number of, especially in light of recent uh, additions to the uh, GHC, uh, a good number of low-hanging bugs that we, we quickly found. Um, now, <clears throat> as far as fixing those bugs, once you have identified them, um, it really isn't that different, except for the fact that instead of having to manually reduce the test case, which in some cases can be very, very difficult. You know, if we look back at the ticket that we saw here, we have a very simple program, but behind that decode UTF-16 LE, there's several thousand lines of code, you know, or at least several hundred, if not thousands, lines of code that you need to sort of sort through and eventually, uh, you know, it, it's only clear that something bad happened between GHCI and the printing of that result. And that's a, there's a lot of code implicated there. Uh, whereas in uh, a test primops model, you have, a, you know, well, you can rely on shrinking to, you know, you already start with a relatively small failing test case, even without shrinking. 
then once you shrink, and we put a fair amount of effort into the shrinker, uh, you can get what is essentially the minimal test case very, very quickly. Um, so it really did, has reduced uh, the amount of time necessary to identify these sorts of issues precisely uh, by, you know, drastically. It's, it's been quite a difference. Um, does that help? Yeah. Uh, so the follow-on question. Yeah. Um, when a user submits a bug, you know that that bug does actually occur in real programs, at least one real program. Yeah. Um, what kind of confidence do you have that the bugs you find here are worth fixing? Well, that, that is a good question. Um, and in some cases, some of these bugs I know could not occur in real programs unless the user explicitly used primops that they, you know, and we, there are some cases, some of the uh, undefined cases in particular that we're still trying to work out are actually in programs which uh, the user would need to write explicitly using unboxed types and primops directly. Uh, you cannot actually with lifted Haskell, you know, the, the nice intro int, for instance, the int type, um, you cannot write a program uh, that would trigger, you know, this sort of undefined behavior. Um, that being said, uh, I think in general, uh, ensuring that we have a well-defined semantics for C minus minus is actually a useful enough exercise. Um, and a good number of these bugs most certainly were reachable. So, from Haskell code. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So we are out of time, and I feel bad for the student <laughs> volunteers. So yep. <laughs> let's talk the official session, and you can keep the discussion after that. Thank you very much. Thank you.